Thank you. My name is Haley Soifer, CEO of the Jewish Democratic Council of America, and I want to welcome you today to our program, Meeting the Moment, Democratic Leadership on Climate Change, featuring Senator Ed Markey, Congressman Sean Kasten, Rabbi Jenny Rosen, moderated by Sarah Rabbi Sarah Bassin. Before we begin today's program, I want to take a moment to recognize where we are in our country's history. Last night, in honor of George Floyd, President Biden said, George's legacy will not be just about his death, but about what we must do with his memory. And we know as Jewish Democrats, it's time to begin the hard work of police reform in America. We welcome yesterday's verdict and we recommit ourselves to doing everything we can to root out systemic racism in our country and move toward a more equitable and just society. And we invite all of you to join us in this effort and urging the Senate to pass both the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act as well as the For the People Act to stop voter suppression, especially that that has targeted communities of color. To take action on this issue, you can visit jewishstems.org. Our program today is taking place not only at that, this critical moment in our history, but also the day before Earth Day and at the beginning of President Biden's global change, global climate summit to discuss one of the most complex, far-reaching, and even existential crises of our lifetime, climate change. Here at JDCA, we are committed to addressing the multifaceted challenges posed by climate change, both here in the United States and around the world. Climate change, as we know, is a national security issue, a foreign policy issue, an economic issue, a racial justice issue, an immigration issue, and the list goes on. There is virtually nothing that is unaffected by the environment. And time is running out for us to turn the tide of this growing threat. So we are thrilled to host this event today, which will be split into two parts, both of which will be facilitated by today's guest moderator, Rabbi Sarah Bassett. The first part will feature a keynote address by our first guest speaker, Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts, followed by audience Q&A. We will then continue the conversation by welcoming Congressman Sean Kasten of Illinois and Rabbi Jenny Rosen before we open it up to our final round of audience questions. If you have a question for any of the panelists throughout the program, please email outreach at jewishdems.org or you can post it in the Zoom chat and we will do our best to address your questions. With that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to JDCA Next Gen Council member, Rabbi Joel Simmons, followed by JDCA board member, Next Gen Council member and political and policy chair, Izzy Klein, to introduce our first guest, Rabbi Simmons. Thank you, Haley. It's my pleasure to introduce my good friend and colleague, today's moderator, Rabbi Sarah Bassan, Associate Rabbi at Temple Emmanuel of Beverly Hills. An expert in interfaith civilian diplomacy, Rabbi Bassan has been called upon to join delegations of faith and political leaders around the world. She is the founding executive director of Newground, a Muslim Jewish partnership for change, whose work building minority-based coalitions and partnerships was recognized in 2013 by former California governor, Jerry Brown, and was named a fellow of security and religious freedom at the UCLA Berkeley Center for International Relations in recognition of her work. Rabbi Bassan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you all. Um, Senator Ed Markey is no stranger to the Jewish Democrats or to the subject of our gathering today, climate change. When it comes to saving the planet, there is no one more dedicated than Senator Markey. Ed was fighting climate change before many of us learned how to program our VCRs, watched Al Gore's climate change documentary, or shared the latest TikTok meme or boosted a salient Twitter thread on the subject. Ed's latest legislative accomplishments have been legendary in the energy environment space from increasing federal fuel economy standards to holding big polluters accountable for their ecological impact to introducing and passing the first comprehensive bill to combat climate change in the House 
to introducing the new the Green New Deal most recently. No one has done more to celebrate Earth Day every day than Senator Ed Markey. As we mark the 51st Earth Day tomorrow, we will continue to follow Senator Markey's leadership in the fight against climate change. Senator Markey, thank you for joining the Jewish Dems once again. Thank you. Oh, yeah. um, thank you, Izzy, so much. Um, by the way, what's a VCR? Just, that's so, that's just so back in ancient history. We are, um, we are moving forward with the speed of the internet uh, to deal with these uh, climate uh, issues out of necessity. And I thank uh, all of the uh, Jewish Democrats for inviting me uh, to be with you here today to discuss this uh, incredibly important uh, issue. Uh, it's absolutely central to our global well-being that we take upon, take this issue on and to do it um, in, in a way that's comprehensive uh, and definitive. Um, uh, Izzy and I go back to the beginning of recorded um, uh, uh, political time and uh, uh, and it's just so great to be with uh, with Izzy, um, who has been my friend uh, forever, and uh, uh, and it's just uh, so great to be with all of you. He Izzy worked on climate issues on my staff with me, so that's how um, uh, close he and I are. And uh, so th this this Earth Week, Earth Day, it's. It's just a, a moment for us to be able to talk about the preservation of, um, of a livable uh, uh, climate and livable planet. Um, because combating the climate crisis is a true task of tikkun olam. It's uh, ensuring uh, that we ensure that this planet that we live on is in fact handed on better than it was given to us. Uh, and that's our, that's our moment uh, and we have to seize upon it. We just left uh, a period where we had a, a president of the United States who was a climate denier. Uh, he was the denier in chief. Um, a, a degree from Trump University uh, was about uh, as close as anyone actually came uh, to understanding uh, climate in the Republican Party during those years. And, a and, and their knowledge of this issue was as bogus as a degree from Trump University. It's good to know that he's gone back down there to Mar-a-Lago, but he doesn't fully understand that it's going to turn into Mara Lagoon over the next 15 years or so. But in a sense, he doesn't care because he can build the protection around himself uh, and Mar-a-Lago uh, that the rest of Florida, the rest of the world cannot do. So it is absolutely urgent uh, that we act and we act uh, quickly. The planet is running a fever. There are no emergency rooms for planets. So we have to take uh, the action which is necessary uh, to be able to avoid the worst, most catastrophic consequences uh, of climate change. Uh, my wife, Dr. Susan Blumenthal, was Assistant Surgeon General of the United States, a two-star admiral in the Public Health Service, uh, and what she believes in is preventative care. Uh, there is no emergency room for a planet, so we have to have preventative care. And what does that mean? Well, that means uh, that uh, we have to deploy all of the technologies that we know uh, are available for us to be able to um, to accomplish this goal. When Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and I uh, introduced the uh, Green New Deal just a little bit more than uh, two years ago, Fox News, Republicans, the fossil fuel industry, even some Democrats, very skeptical of uh, the Green New Deal. Uh, but their attacks were of course absurd. They said, oh, Green New Deal. That is socialism. Well, you know what socialism is? 
tax breaks for the oil, gas, and coal industry for 100 years. If you give us some of that socialism for wind and solar and all electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids and battery storage technologies and transmission technologies, offshore wind, we will bury the fossil fuel industry within a generation. That's where we are. And what happened is that last uh, November and on January 5th in Georgia, everyday people uh, took to the streets and the ballot box to make jobs and justice and climate action central to our political system. And there is now a diverse intersectional army of activists and leaders and communities which are demanding the most ambitious action possible on climate. The Green New Deal changed everything. We said that it's all interrelated. We said that climate crisis is related to the racial crisis, which is related to the health crisis and the economic crisis in our country. And we built it right into the Green New Deal. And people said, why are you linking all of these issues? Well, in the past two years, um, I think that the Green New Deal has raised the world's awareness to the scope and the scale of the challenges we face and the intersectionality uh, of all of these issues. Um, let's be honest, uh, environmental justice wasn't something that people were talking about two years ago, but we built it into the Green New Deal. We made sure that we focused upon frontline communities, communities of color, uh, poor communities in America, which have historically been uh, the communities closest to the pollution and therefore to the asthma inducing toxic materials, the, the cancer inducing toxic materials that uh, emanate from those facilities. So <clears throat> we now have a movement. And by the way, Joe Biden's $2 trillion Build Back Better plan, its DNA is the Green New Deal because he says that 40% of that $2 trillion or $800 billion has to go towards frontline communities, communities of color, the communities that have always been adversely uh, affected. So things have changed since we won. Let's start with General Motors. It wasn't on the scoreboard two years ago that General Motors would say that they're planning on producing no new internal combustion engines by the year 2035. That was not on the scoreboard. That's how much things have changed. The same thing is true for the goal, which um, Joe Biden has now set for uh, all utilities uh, in, the, um, in the United States of America not producing uh, anything that uh, not using any source of energy that produces greenhouse gases by the year 2035 with utilities nodding on the sidelines. That was not on the school board two years ago. And so our belief is that we can have jobs and justice, that we can create millions of new jobs, uh, that we can ensure that it is the frontline communities that are at the front of the line, uh, both to get the remediation, but also to get those new jobs, those union jobs that we are going to be uh, creating. Uh, and we do so in a way that ultimately takes advantage of this opportunity to address the four ongoing and intersecting crises, the public health disaster, racial injustice, the climate crisis, and economic inequity. All of it can be dealt with and dealt with in a comprehensive uh, fashion uh, in, a, um, in a Green New Deal slash Build Back Better bill that will uh, come through the United States um, uh, Senate and House. We want Republicans to work with us. We want them to partner with us. Uh, we want to ensure that they are all a part of uh, any product that we ultimately produce. But we can't wait for them. We can't allow to happen what happened in 2009, where they never really came to the table. There's a great play, uh, Waiting for Godot. Uh, and Godot never shows up on stage. And if we're not careful, Republicans will never show up on this political stage and we'll have run out of time. 
to do this job. So we want to give them an opportunity to come forward. But if they don't, if they say, no, we don't want to raise taxes. No, we don't want to uh, fund uh, programs that have green uh, in their DNA, then we just have to move on. So yesterday, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and I just introduced our civilian um, climate corps, which is modeled on FDR's uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. And our, 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 our goal is to have 1.5 million young Americans out there working as part of a, a new national service program uh, that would uh, use federally funded uh, programs in order to help communities to respond uh, to uh, the opportunities that a clean economy will, um, will present. And these new core members, they, they'll work on everything from making our schools and buildings more resilient and environmentally friendly uh, to ensuring that we build uh, the green infrastructure that this um, country sorely needs. And what AOC and I say is that 50% of the uh, investments should be in environmental justice communities and 50% of the core people should be from those very same communities. That has to be our goal moving forward, jobs and justice as we solve the climate crisis. So I thank you all for inviting me to uh, join you today and I'd love to take some questions, Izzy, if, um, if it's at all possible. Um, so first of all, thank you, Senator Markey. I, I appreciate your framing of this in terms of jobs and justice, um, not just in terms of the past language that we've used. Um, given how, uh, let me actually start with this in saying that um, I've got a few questions for you, uh, but to the audience, please remember if you have some questions that you should be putting them in the chat and we will get to as many as possible. Um, Senator Markey, you have been at this for a very long time, well before it was a priority among your fellow Democrats. Tell us what caused you to step up so early. Ah, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, when I was a boy growing up in Malden, Massachusetts, um, the Malden River was four blocks from my house. And the Malden River is still four blocks from my house. And it was a blue collar community. Irish, Italian, Jewish, Black, Protestant. That was the Malden that I grew up in, about 65,000 people. And along the Malden River, which is where all those people um, worked, every, every Converse All-Star was made five blocks from my house along the Malden River. Uh, there were coal companies, there were chemical companies, and they used the Malden River as a dumping ground, as a sewer. And um, and the Malden River was kind of black with a pre-Jimi Hendrix purple haze over it. So when I was about 10 or 11 years old, my mother said to me, Eddie, whatever you do, do not swim in the Malden River. So it was pretty clear to me, and I think every other Irish, Italian, Jewish, Black, and, and Protestant kid in Malden, that uh, we weren't living in uh, along the Mississippi. We weren't Tom Sawyer or Huck Finn, you know, that our river you could not swim in. So when your mother says something like that to you when you're 10 or 11, that will animate then how you view what corporations do to our natural environment. And so when I got to Congress, which I did when I was 30 years old, I asked to be put on the Environment and Energy Subcommittee. And from there on, it's been an iteration of, uh, of uh, legislation over the years um, to, uh, to try to make our environment, our world a better and a safer a place to live. I had, I had back in 19, when I started, uh, and I'll say this advisedly, when I started in Congress 45 years ago, I had Chelsea in my congressional district, which is the poorest community in New England. And I worked on lead paint issues. The, the Tobin Bridge, the Mystic River Bridge goes right over Chelsea. Uh, they had the highest uh, level of contamination of children with lead uh, of any city in New England and probably the United States. So I actually began on these issues on my first day in Congress, dealing with environmental justice issues. And even today, Chelsea had the highest level of coronavirus because they have the, still the highest level of asthma. 
uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts. And it's a direct correlation. And those people who live there are black, brown, uh, immigrant, they're uh, poorer, uh, and they just have never received the, the, the protections which they deserve. Yeah, I would, so, I would imagine that childhood experience gave you such a visceral connection to the frontline communities that you're fighting for in the legislation today. Um, you know, over the last 30 years, I'm curious to hear from your perspective how you've seen the whole conversation and the debate shift. Are there signs that you're seeing that give you hope that the way that we're having this conversation is improving and our response will improve? Uh, I think the biggest change is young people. Young people are just ticked off that this problem has been handed to them. And so uh, when Henry Waxman and I passed our waxman Markey bill in 2009 through the House of Representatives, and it was then killed in the Senate, that was an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by the year 2050, 80% by 2050. But we didn't have a movement behind us, really. There were not people out there agitating. Yeah, we had organized environmental groups, but it just didn't have the grassroots power. So what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and I did when we introduced the Green New Deal on February 7th of 2019, our goal was to partner with the Sunrise Movement. It was to partner with all these young people in colleges and high schools and junior high schools all across America to create a movement. And the Sunrise Movement is now uh, a political powerhouse. Uh, they, they helped to elect uh, Jamal Bowman, Mondaire Jones uh, in New York, Corey Bush in St. Louis. Uh, these, are, these are just incredible young people who are just tired of the status quo. So for me, the most hopeful um, uh, part of what's occurred over the last couple of years uh, is young people. Even in my race to get reelected to the Senate in 2020, people wrote me off early on. Um, Congressman Joe Kennedy was running against me. But my secret weapon was I was partnered with the Sunrise Movement. Uh, and by the end, we had thousands and thousands of young people all across the state of Massachusetts all rallying uh, against the climate crisis for a Green New Deal. And so I think that actually has injected itself into Washington right now, definitely inside the Democratic Party. And so the aspirations that, uh, that are out there now far exceed anything that anyone was talking about a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I think that it still has a, a ways to go, but uh, young people are leading us. And, uh, and I think that's the most heartening part uh, of uh, this new political climate that we're working in. I think certainly on the issue of climate change, it has debunked the conventional wisdom that younger voters um, and younger activists are um, not part of the equation. And, uh, and this particular thing, they're really starting to, to shift it. Um, so I, I, I wanna talk about the policies that you've pursued throughout your career. Um, you've been really focused on setting important environmental standards, uh, pushing us to develop renewable energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, holding corporations accountable for their effects on the environment. Um, where do you think you have been most successful? And what do you think it's going to take for Congress to finally pass comprehensive climate change legislation? Uh, that's a good, that's a good um, question. Well, I could, I could use a number of examples, but back in 1987, uh, and I know Larry Sidman uh, has joined us, who also was on my staff, um, uh, we passed a uh, appliance efficiency bill. So the air conditioning, the lighting, um, the, um, uh, the refrigeration that we use, that's what necessitates coal burning plants or natural gas burning plants from being constructed. It's just turning on the lights, the air conditioning. That's all it is. It's the cumulative demand from all these devices that we plug in. So that law, the Appliance Efficiency Act of 1987, that began a revolution in terms of increase in efficiency of these devices. So much so that air conditioning, for example, um, is now 
not no longer recognizable as a technology in the way it was in 1987. So that law ultimately has resulted in 200 fewer coal burning plants ever having to have been constructed because you didn't need the, elect the electricity because the air conditioning was so much more efficient. Just to give you an example, back in 1987, 80% of all peak demand for electricity in Texas in the summer was air conditioning. Well, you double the efficiency of those devices and you backed out the need for uh, a, a lot of uh, coal to ever have been burnt. And in 2007, I was successful uh, in um, leading from the House on a law which President Obama then used to increase fuel economy standards to 54. 0.5 miles per gallon in uh, 20, uh, uh, 2011. And uh, uh, it, I'm sorry, he did that in 2010, excuse me. And, uh, and, that's a, and, and, we, and that law was the law that was used in conjunction with the California Clean Air Act waiver in order to accomplish that goal. Well, that single act is the single largest reduction in greenhouse gases of any law ever passed in any country in the history of the world. And that's, of course, where Trump went first to roll back uh, those, uh, those standards, to just give a gift to the auto industry and more to the oil industry because it was an existential threat to their business model if cars could go 54 miles per gallon and not 27 miles per gallon. So, um, and General Motors, I hate to say it, they were on board with that whole plan. And now that we've won, however, uh, Joe Biden is promising to go back to 54.5 miles per gallon uh, and make it even a greater uh, standard that is put on the books. So I'm, kind of, I'm proud of, some, of, 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 of my laws. I could go through many others, but uh, I'm proud of the laws, Rabbi, that I've been able to author. And there's a lot more this year that I want to see on uh, on the books, including a, a, a huge climate bank that I want to create so that local communities and uh, smaller businesses can apply for super low interest loans so they can make their, build, their, their businesses more energy efficient or be able to kind of transform their own lives at the local level uh, that will reduce greenhouse gases individually, but then in the collective that uh, makes the United States the leader. Well, we thank you for your extended career on all of this, and I'm going to hand it back over now to uh, to Haley Swafer. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much, Senator Markey, for your wisdom and for your tireless leadership on this critically important issue. We are we are grateful to have you in the Senate. We were delighted to support you in your reelection, and we are eager to continue to partner with you to combat climate change together. Thank anyway, you. well, th thank you for having me on. Thank you for having my back in um, in uh, uh, in two thousand and twenty. Uh, and uh, and again, what you stand for is, in my opinion, what the core of who we have to be as a country, which is um, yes, jobs, but justice, which is attached to it, and uh, justice in all aspects of American life. So, thank you so much for having me with you again today. Thank you, and thank you for sharing our values and fighting for them in the Senate. Thank you. We know that comprehensive challenges require comprehensive solutions, and if we're going to succeed, it's going to take leadership, leaders like Senator Markey and others to step up and take action now. We have two additional leaders with us today, Congressman Sean Kasten of Illinois and Rabbi Jenny Rosen. And while their backgrounds might be different, their commitment and dedication to addressing climate, the climate crisis is similar. In a moment, Rabbi Bassin will continue with the second half of our program, followed by another audience Q&A. Uh, I want to remind you, please submit your questions to outreach at jewishdems.org, or you can post them in the chat. And as always, we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can. I'm now delighted to turn it over to JDCA's Senior Strategy and Policy Advisor, Steve Sheffy uh, in Chicago, uh, and JDCA Next Gen Leadership Council Chair, Josh Rolnick in New York to introduce our next guest. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Haley. It is my honor to introduce a good friend of mine and of JDCA, Congressman Sean Kasten. 
Sean is a second term Democratic member of Congress representing the Illinois 6th Congressional District. Prior to Sean's defeating an entrenched Republican incumbent in 2018, a Democrat had not represented this district in nearly 50 years. Sean won for many reasons, not the least of which was that Haley and I canvassed for him. As a respected scientist, clean energy entrepreneur and author, Representative Kasten is at the forefront of the fight against climate change and for clean energy. Before he was elected to Congress, Sean served as the CEO of two clean energy companies. And since being elected, he has made addressing climate change his top priority. By taking his scientific expertise and business acumen to Washington, Representative Kasten has already established himself as one of the leading voices on environmental issues. Congressman, thank you for joining us. I'm now happy to hand it over to Josh Wolnick. Thank you, Steve. Rabbi Rosen is a renowned religious leader and a fearless political activist. She is the founder and CEO of Dayenu, a Jewish call to climate action, which is a new organization combining Jewish spirituality and grassroots organizing to mobilize the American Jewish community to act against the threat of climate change. Before founding Dayenu, Rabbi Rosen's decades of social justice work includes serving as director of the Jewish Life and Values Program at the Nathan Cummings Foundation, and as vice president of Hayas, originally called the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, where she helped spearhead the Jewish response to the global Syrian refugee crisis. Rabbi Rosen, as someone with an innate understanding of how our Jewish values compel us to take action, we are so grateful that you are here with us at JDCA today. Thank you. Rabbi Bassin. Steve, Josh, thank you. And Representative Kasten and Rabbi Rosen, I so appreciate you two joining us with your expertise and wisdom on this subject. Um, I'd just like for you both to start and take a minute to tell us a little bit about yourself and why climate change is so important to you. Um, Representative Kasten, let's begin with you. Sure, so the first question is, is my audio okay? All right, perfect. Um, so thanks so much for having me and thanks for all that you do. Um, 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 Steve, your, your friendship means so much to me and all your wisdom. Um, the, I, I grew up around climate change. My dad um, founded a company that became the world's largest district or the largest district energy company in the United States because in the 70s, he got convinced this was an issue. So I grew up around it and I said, all right, dad's already grappled with this on the heating and cooling side. I'm gonna get into vehicle fuels. Um, thought I was going to be in cellulosic ethanol, went to work as a consultant, then got the entrepreneurial bug, sold our company in 2016, having built um, about 80 different projects, deployed $200 million. Every single one of them was at least twice as efficient as the U.S. electric grid. Every single one of them used technologies. There were the patents that expired 80 years ago. And I just sort of came to the realization that here we are living in this country where there are no thermodynamic laws that prevent us from massively lowering CO2 emissions. There are no economic laws that prevent us from doing so profitably, but there are a lot of United States laws that get in the way. And, and I actually take that as cause for some optimism because of the three of those, there's only one of those laws that you can change. <laughs> and so that's how I got into this line of work. Beautiful, get ourselves out of our own way. Um, Rabbi Rosen, tell us a little bit about yourself and why this has become a priority for you. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's an, an honor um, really to be here with all of you. Um, as you heard, I'm a rabbi and Jewish social justice leader and activist. I'm based here in New York City. Um, and I've worked for many years engaging young people in service and activism, uh, building the movement of Jewish social justice, a sector that's sort of been an evolving sector over the last 20 years, um, both through nonprofits and philanthropy. Um, and most recently at Hias, helping to reintroduce Hias to the American Jewish community and developing a Jewish response to the refugee crisis. And I became increasingly concerned, not just about the climate crisis, but the way in which it intersects with all other issues. Um, it is the existential issue of our time, and it relates, as we've begun to talk about, to every single other issue. Um, and alarmed by the way that the Jewish community has not been fully showing up. Um, and a year ago launched uh, Dainu, a Jewish call to climate action, which is a new organization mobilizing American Jews, Jewish communities and Jewish institutions to confront the climate crisis. 
uh, we like to say with spiritual audacity and bold political action. Um, and I'll also just clarify that I'm here today in my personal capacity. And it's a pleasure to be here. So Rabbi Rosen, you've got a room full of Jewish Democrats. Talk to us about what uh, motivates you Jewishly uh, to be involved in this work. What, what is your Jewish route for climate activism? So I think that there are two um, Jewish values that people often reference when they talk about the environment. People often talk about uh, Baal Tashrit, the prohibition to destroy or to waste. And the other one that we often hear is Shomrei Adama, the mandate to protect the earth. And these, of course, are both powerful and important values. But I think that there are other fundamental Jewish values that call us to confront the climate crisis. Values like choosing life, Shomer Ger Yatom Ba'amanah, protecting the most vulnerable. At its core, the climate crisis is about social, economic, and racial justice. It's about whether we believe that every human being is created but Salam Elohim in the image of God and deserves to have their most basic human needs met, air, water, food, shelter. It's about the Jewish value of tzedek, as we've been talking about justice, and how we will reimagine and rebuild a different kind of society. At its core, I think confronting the climate crisis is about a commitment to humanity continuing Lador Vador, the most foundational Jewish value, the idea that we will continue generation to generation. All of these are what is at stake if as a nation, we're gonna put ourselves on a path to a just and sustainable world and future. Uh, I also think, you know, if that's sort of from a values perspective, I also think there are reasons for a Jewish communal response that are on a communal level. There is a diverse movement of people who are fighting for climate justice, right? This includes faith groups and black, brown and indigenous communities and young people as we were hearing from, from Lynn Markey. And we need every part of that diverse American Jewish community, including the Jewish community to be part of that. Um, while we're only 2% of the population, the Jewish community has a very strong voice in American society and politics. And this is an all hands on deck moment. No one, no one can sit this out. Uh, and I think that for the Jewish community to show up in all of its people and power is essential in this moment in history. It's part of what it means to live as a Jew right now. Thank you. Representative Kasten, you spoke about your experience in the private sector um, with your two clean energy companies, Recycled Energy Development and Turbostream Corporation, which focused on greenhouse gas um, reduction. Uh, I'm just curious, what are the lessons that you've learned from the private sector that you are now carrying into your role as a congressperson and through your legislative? So I guess I guess I'd say there's, you know, there are the business lessons and there are the moral lessons. And I want to separate the two. The the, the business lessons is that the as I said in my you know the last answer, there's a lot of money to be made by lowering CO2 emissions. And I think we have talked about it the wrong way in large part because anything we do to generate energy with less fossil fuel input is also something we are doing to generate energy where we don't have to pay for as much fossil fuel, right? If you, if you put you know, better insulation in your home, you're, you're, you got more money in your pocket at the end of the month. If you put a solar panel on your roof, you don't have to pay for electricity anymore. If you get an electric car, you don't have to pay for gasoline and you pay a lot less for electricity. Now, of course you have to you know, have the money to pay for all those things in the first instance, but that's an investment. And what I did in the private sector was make that investment. And I, I find myself more often than I should be reminding my colleagues that there's a difference between an operating expense and a capital expense. And a lot of the conversation we have about, can we afford to pay for this? I think is more appropriately framed as, as a, what is the return on this investment? And is it and is, does it exceed the you know two three percent that the United States is currently borrowing at? And the answer to that's an overwhelming yes. Um, and and you know and as I said, that's a big opportunity. I, I do though want to mention the moral lesson. I one of the things that you find as a CEO when you talk to other CEOs, you can be in wildly different industries where you have no expertise in what they do, but there are a couple of commonalities that every CEO and you know when you meet them when we would meet each other, you have some things that you all agree on. And one of them is that every CEO faces this tension 
which is that while you have the only job in the company that every day talks to your investors, talks to your employees, and talks to your customers, your compensation is only set by one of those stakeholder groups. And I always found that if I, if I had, if I didn't have a little bit of tension in the boardroom, then I probably wasn't doing my job to represent the voices that weren't at the table because you know I, I had obligations to all those stakeholders. And I find in Washington that it's very healthy to maintain that same approach. Um, there is there is nobody who comes to Washington and advocates for market efficiency. No no business wants their industry to be to be better for competition. Um, and uh, and by definition, future generations are not at the table. And so as we think about what our role is as legislators, we absolutely need to get the best wisdom from everybody who's at the table, but we have to step back in the same way that I felt compelled to in the boardroom and say, who is not at the table? And let me try to make sure that I am doing the best I can to represent um, their interests as well. So I appreciate that you're speaking to this um, need to hold markets accountable um, for the economic risk and the damage that uh, that they cause, that's a whole nother factor that's part of this conversation. What are the financial risks that are associated with not acting? Um, and what's your sense of how we can do our best to mitigate them now? Um, why is adopting clean energy solutions the right thing, not just for the American workers that you're speaking of, but also for a, our private companies? Well, the I, I, number one, I've been I've introduced quite a few bills um, to, to compel our financial regulators to address the systemic risk that climate change puts on our financial system. And some last term, one this term, we'll have some more. Um, it's been extremely refreshing to finally have a set of financial regulators who are are probably going to do it regardless. And so now we're trying to make sure they do it in a durable fashion. And I mention that though because there are risks of inaction, and there are also financial risks of action. And we have to be sensitive to both. The risks of inaction, I think, are, are pretty obvious to us. The, there's something like $23 trillion of property that's at loss because of rising seas. If we were to eliminate all CO2 emissions tomorrow, globally, there's a lag time in the system. It takes time, first the planet heats up, then the ice shelf melts, then the sea levels rise, then you have a, you know, a tsunami event that comes through and causes damage. If we eliminated all CO2 tomorrow, there is at a minimum two feet of sea level rise that's already come. At two feet of sea level rise, that, is, that basically puts at risk every major city on the Eastern seaboard. That's a lot of damage. There's also risks from wildfires. There's risks from the derechos that come through the Midwest. And, um, and that's a real risk. And you start asking yourself in the financial sector, how is that going to ripple through? Who's going to drop out first? Is it going to be the, the mortgagers? Is it going to be the insurers? Is it going to be the reinsurers? We're already hearing some evidence that, that auto insurers in, the, in Tornado Alley are taking hail, hail riders out of their auto policies because they're seeing so much damage. And so they're protected, but somebody with a car who's got hail damage isn't there. Um, big deal. I, I could go on. I see somebody commenting the tax health costs. There's a lot of other things. However, I, I keep coming back to the optimism. We are going to save so much money in this transition that we also need to be sensitive to that risk because the transition to clean energy is a massive wealth transfer from energy producers to energy consumers. And, and that means a huge, and, and by the way, that's a rising tide. The net gain is going to be overwhelmingly positive because we're gonna pay so much less for energy. Just in the last 10 years, we've seen the grid CO2 emissions fall by 26%, and the price of power fall by 6%. That's awesome. But a rise, I think we delude ourselves when we say a rising tide lifts all boats, especially when the rising tide comes quick. It tends to flood out a few on the corners. And in thinking about what's going to happen as we make that transition, Illinois, the district where I live that has a lot of educated people, has a lot of nuclear and wind capacity, they're probably gonna be okay. If you're in Charleston, West Virginia, it's gonna be tough, right? And we need to think both about the financial shocks of what happens as money moves out of there. What happens to the first national bank of Charleston? Who are they exposed to? 
But we also have to think about the human consequences. Um, and I think we need to be we need to be honest and not patronizing about what happens to workers. Um, the we, we've been in our history through two major energy transitions already. We're about to go through a third. First from muscle to mechanical power. The second from mechanical to electrical power. And the one we're going through now is from dirty power to clean power. Every one of those transitions has been a massive increase in labor productivity, right? If you, if you shut down a coal plant and you install solar panels, you don't need fuel handlers, you don't need ash handlers, you get a lot more energy per unit of labor. And if that means everybody gets paid twice as much for working half as many hours, that's awesome. I think the history of those transitions is that the, uh, the owners of the robots tend to accumulate the wealth. And so we need to think about how to make this, embrace that transition, embrace that gain in labor productivity. It's the only way we grow labor, grow our you know, standard of living. But you know, the I important think points that you're making is that there are so many unseen parts of the way that climate change uh, permeates and has consequences. Um, into our lives. Um, and it's not as simple as, you know, environment versus versus jobs. Um, as, as, I, I like, as I like to say, welcome the advent of the steam shovel, but have sympathy for John Henry. Precisely. I, I'm curious, Rabbi Rosen, from you, if there are any other kind of um, unseen or under the radar impacts of climate change that you want to raise up that we're not talking about as much that haven't permeated the public discourse. Well, I think that the climate crisis intersects with every single other issue, right? It's not just jobs and economy, though clearly those are central. Um, racial injustice, housing, food, public health, uh, immigration and refugee issues, uh, part of what brought me into this work. International, we haven't talked about the geopolitical dimensions of this, uh, national security and, and women's issues. This impacts women even, even more so. So you name it, there's an intersection. And I think that sadly, there's not a single person or community or institution that can claim that climate crisis is not relevant to them. And I think that's going to become more and more recognized as it becomes more and more inescapable. But I also, also think that it's we can't have this conversation without also acknowledging that the impacts of the climate crisis, they rest disproportionately on those who've been historically marginalized. Right, so people living in the global south, in poverty, in particularly vulnerable areas, people who experience racism and other kinds of bigotry. In the United States, that often means black and brown and indigenous communities. Um, I think about you know, the climate crisis, it's like a force multiplier. It exacerbates historical inequities, even, and this is what makes it you know, more complicated, even as it impacts everyone. So on the one hand, justice and equity have to be essential to confronting the climate crisis. And none of us, regardless of wealth or skin color, is safe from its impacts. Um, and I actually think, again, sadly, I think the coronavirus has been a helpful analogy for people to understand that both, that both end. This means, um, as, as Representative Kasten was talking about, the solutions have to center frontline communities, those who are most impacted by the climate crisis. And that's why the administration's whole government, kind of whole government climate roadmap and the American Jobs Plan, it's recently announced infrastructure bill. That's why it will target 40% of the benefits of climate and clean infrastructure investments to disadvantaged communities. And it's why this whole concept of a just transition is so important. As we move to renewable energy, how do we ensure that it is accessible to all? And how do we retrain those who've been working in the fossil fuel industry in a way that really invests in them? And that we make sure that the, the way that we're addressing the issue, how we're making climate and infrastructure investments address inequities rather than exacerbating them. And I think we actually have sort of an incredible opportunity right now to address these intersecting crises of climate destruction at an unfathomable scale that we are all experiencing more and more with each passing day, the pandemic and the economic devastation that it's wrought and the insidious racial and economic inequity and injustice that continues to plague, to plague our nation. Um, and this is, it's, it's hard I think to overstate the momentousness, momentousness of this moment um, in history, both in terms of what we're facing 
and in terms of what's possible to re-envision and rebuild. So, so I've got a two-part question for both of you, beginning with you, um, Representative Kasson, which is, you know, what's what's the call to action for us in terms of how we can be part of the the solution? And then, of course, what can we as um, community doing from the liberal side of the political spectrum to overcome the polarization um, and have a message that permeates into more socially conservative? Um, parts of our country and and to hopefully get some Republican support for more ambitious uh, climate policy. So Representative Kasson and then Rabbi Rosen. Well, to, to your first question, um, leverage your networks. This problem is, is too big for any one of us to change within our, our footprint. And so what we can do to leverage your networks, if it's your, if it's your temple, if it's your church, if it's your government, whatever your action is, you know, get people to follow. The reason I so I'll try to do this as a business issue was I figured if I could try to appeal to people's greed, that's fine, <laughs> right? Get people to copy you, get people to make money. To, to your second point, um, I would just urge everybody not to confuse partisanship in Washington for partisanship in the country. Overwhelming majority of it, I would submit to you 100% of Americans wanna pay less for energy. 100% of Americans want clean air. Um, a hundred percent of Americans um, want to leave a better world for their kids than the one they've inherited from their, their parents. And I think when you, when you, and, and frankly, if you, you can ask the question a lot of ways in their support, I think the challenge we have is that the, the, the Republican party as it is represented in Washington does not represent a majority of Americans, right? The, they lose the, the when they win the presidency, it's on the electoral college. Their power in the Senate derives from the over pop, the over representation of small states um, and the filibuster, which we need to get rid of. Um, and that can make things appear much more, um, I think, partisan than they actually are. Um, if we get rid of gerrymandering, if we get rid of the filibuster, if we make DC a state, um, I think if we pass HR one, um, you know, um, to make some of those reforms permanent, reform campaign finance reform, what you will find is two parties who are competing for the majority of the American voters instead of one party that is a very broad big tent and another party that's that's really holding on to. And I would submit to you abusing those powers in our government that disproportionately accrue to the party in the minority. Um, and that's a that's a that's a government problem. But but take comfort in the fact that the majority of the American people are, are already there and ready to move on this. Well, Representative Kasson, I know that you need to leave um, precisely at four o'clock. So if you um, filter off, we thank you for your time. Um, but Rabbi Rosen, I'm going to throw exactly the question back to you. What's what's the call to action for us, and what's the messaging that you're using for permeating more socially conservative spaces? So I think there's a very immediate, very tachless, very concrete call to action, which is that President Biden has put forth a multi-trillion dollar recovery plan to rebuild and transform our infrastructure that will do those three things, put millions of Americans back to work, invest in renewable energy, and address environmental uh, justice. And this could really serve as a roadmap for the just green recovery that we need, but only if Congress acts. So the immediate uh, call to action would be to call on Congress uh, for everyone to be reaching out to their senators um, and representatives to make a massive investment in clean energy and infrastructure, put millions back to work, address environmental injustice. So I, I will, you know, will say there are lots of ways to do this. Um, one is Dainu actually has a very easy call tool on our website. Um, if you want to use that, if you want to do it through another organization or mechanism, um, but this, these next few weeks, are actually pretty critical weeks um, in terms of how this once in a generation legislation uh, can will move forward or won't move forward and what will be in it or won't be in it. Um, in terms of educating our community, I think that there's too much similar to what Representative Kasten said. I think that there that we overly uh, play into the narrative of climate being um, a partisan issue. Um, I, that's not what the data shows in terms of um, our country. It's certainly not the direction that we're moving in demographically in terms of younger voters. And I think 
as big, if not bigger, a problem is that there are plenty of people who are very concerned about the climate crisis and not doing much. Or what they're doing is in their personal practices, which is important. We all should eat less meat. We need to green our institutions in the time frame we have. That is not alone going to enable us to avoid the most catastrophic impacts. And for that, we need to be talking about systemic change. So I think giving people, and this is the, the work that we seek to do, and we see more and more of the Jewish community really engaging in the Jewish climate movement to address the climate crisis on a systemic level, to address legislation, to move money, uh, to center communities that are most impacted. Um, and I, I think that giving people pathways and also, and this is the, I think the, the, the last piece I'll sort of end with, is that we have the potential, it's not too late. There's incredible urgency and there is still possibility. And so I think part of facing the climate crisis requires us to remember and access our collective power because we, we have tremendous collective power. And we act today knowing that we're just one small part of a much larger movement and a much more powerful collective. And we need to move forward with both that sense of urgency and that sense of possibility. Uh, things that are very much rooted in the Jewish tradition of recognizing danger and of holding out tremendous, tremendous hope um, and possibility in our collective power. I'll say that your optimism along with uh, Representative Kasten and, and Senator Markey was certainly palpable, which is really inspiring given how entrenched you are and, and all of the dirty sides of this that you see. So thank you for your continued inspired leadership. I'm going to turn it over back now to Haley Silver. Thank you so much. I want to thank Representative Kasten, Rabbi Rosen for being with us today. And of course, I want to thank Senator Markey uh, and all of you for sharing your expertise. I also want to thank you, uh, Rabbi Sarah Bassin, for moderating today's conversation and to everyone uh, who's joined us on behalf of JDCA. Today's program has demonstrated why we need our leaders to take action on climate change. Congress must uh, also act and pass comprehensive and effective climate change legislation. Unfortunately, we are suffering from misinformation and inaction and specifically 139 members of Congress are climate change deniers. To put it another way, that's 52% of the House and of House Republicans and 60% of Senate Republicans who don't believe in climate change. And we can't allow them to drive US policy on this huge crisis and issue. So I invite all of you to join us, to join JDCA in effectively holding them accountable and encouraging that they pass legislation and bold, take bold action to mitigate the effects of climate change. You can find an action item on climate change on our website, jewishdems.org backslash action and learn more about how you can join us in ensuring our voices are heard on this issue. With that, I will turn things over to JDCA's program director, Bobby Saferstein, to preview our upcoming events and wrap up. Over to you, Bobby. Thank you, Haley. And thank you to everyone who spoke today, contributed today, and for all of you at home who are joining us to discuss one of the most important issues of our life, which is climate change. As we already said, today's conversation comes at an auspicious moment. It's an inflection point in our country's history on the road from accountability to justice. Via hafta l'reacha kamocha, loving thy neighbor as thyself, and shomri adama, uh, conserving and protecting the land really are two of the most fundamental principles of our Jewish tradition, and they are essential ingredients to achieving justice. What would it mean to truly treat each other and our environment with the respect they deserve? To understand how our actions are having consequences and act as such. We hope you enjoy today's program and welcome you as partners in the fight against voter suppression, climate change, and as we pursue a more equitable, just, and environmentally sustainable future for us all. To, de to that end, uh, please visit jewishdems.org to learn about all the ways that Jewish Dems are taking action on these issues and many more. While there, you can check out some of our upcoming events, such as next Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we are having a pre-address schmooze where we will be previewing President Biden's first joint address to Congress as he approaches his first 100 days in office. 
what it means to become a JDCA member. You'll learn all about that if you visit our website and how to partake in some of our intimate and exclusive upcoming programs and opportunities, including meeting some of the freshman members of Congress, including Jake Oshenklaus, Mondaire Jones, and Richie Torres. Check out the website to learn more. And also check out all of our 14 and growing grassroots state chapters across the country. Join in with volunteers as they meet with their respective members of Congress in just a few weeks in the middle of June as we have a week long uh, effort of action on the Hill, different meetings with representatives. So please join one of our local chapters and uh, join in. Lastly, if you happen to be on the Clubhouse app, join the Jewish Dems Club and tune in every Thursday evening to discuss some of the issues Jewish Dems care most about. If you're a Jewish Democrat, JDCA is your home on Clubhouse. Lastly, make sure to check out uh, Rabbi Rosen and our friends at dayenu.org to see um, their action items in addition to ours. Thank you again for joining us today for this conversation, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care.